Give me the nod, Caroline. So we're live. Okay, members, we are now live. So we have got quorum to take evidence um, today. So I wanted to clear the meeting open to the public. And the meeting this afternoon, as with all, is fully virtual. And as always, is recorded and broadcast live. So um, the, the members that we currently have with us are myself, Emma Shear in the chair. We've got Paula Bradshaw, Carol Nicolne and Mark Durkin. First item on our agenda is apologies. And we have got uh, formal apologies from Mike Nesbitt. And we don't yet have anyone from the DUP with us. So because we don't have quorum to um, handle any committee business, I'm going to bypass uh, some of the, the items and go straight to our first presentation. And at the outset, can I apologise and formally note our appreciation to the Alliance of Churches who were supposed to be joining us at very last minute um, today because we had had a previous cancellation and because of the assembly business with the uh, announcement of easements of restrictions, we've had to ask the, the churches to postpone and they're going to join us at a later date. So just want to formally acknowledge our thanks to them for being so accommodating last minute. And can I ask members to note the written briefing from Professor Louise Melinder, which you'll find at page three in your table papers pack. Um, Louise Melinder has provided us with a, a briefing on human rights law standards on victims' rights. So I just want to note that and thank her for forwarding that to us. And now move on to our presentation from Colin Nugelega. So I'll give um, broadcasting a minute to bring Kruger and Podrick into the spotlight. Okay, Jim Atasha. Hi, folk. Hello. Okay. We have Kruger. Yeah. Can you hear us? Kruger, I think you're on mute. I, I thought I could, yeah. <laughs> I was talking there. Look, can I, can I do it, Seth? I just apologise for the rushed nature of today's session. Uh, we've had some last minute amendments because of, of assembly business. And just thanks for your uh, your willingness to join us this afternoon and uh, the, how accommodating you've been. So, Gorham Agath and uh, Falcher Rove, and go ahead. Gorham Agath, and more dirt me as Mr. Crawford and Moody, more bonnie store advocate job to the country in Gilia. And my colleague Podrick is here, is here with me today. I'd just like on behalf of country in Gilia to thank you for the opportunity to be with you today to discuss the case of the Irish language here in the new decade, new approach era. And the focus of our talk and hopefully discussion afterwards and the written submission today relates to the question about language rights in the context of a bill of rights. I suppose we have to go back to the, the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 when a new year of equality was promised for the Irish language in the North, when specific and strong commitments were made regarding the promotion and protection of the language, including taking resolute action to promote the language, the statutory duty for Irish medium education, and to seek to remove where possible restrictions which would discourage or work against the maintenance or development of the language. And I suppose it's in the Good Friday Agreement as well, where the development of proposals for a Bill of Rights for the North emerges from the agreement in accordance with its own mandate set out in the agreement and under domestic legislation, the Human Rights Commission on the 10th of December 2008 delivered its final advice on the scope of the Bill of Rights for the North to the British government. And they included the recommendations which applicable to ourselves. And it says, public authorities must as a minimum act compatibly with obligations undertaken by the UK government under the European Charter for Regional Minority Languages. So, given and despite these commitments that have been made in, in the Good Friday Agreement, the Irish speaking community has faced and continually been obstructed in using the language and continuous attacks have been made on those who choose to live their lives um, through Irish. And as a result of that, pressure came from the community to ensure Irish language rights are enshrined in law and to achieve Irish language legislation for the first time over in the North. And arising from those efforts as part of the St Andrews Agreement of 2006, it was clearly promised that the British government would introduce an Irish Language Act reflecting the experience of Wales and the South of Ireland and, the work, and to work with the executive to enhance and safeguard the development of the Irish language. Now, that commitment has never been implemented. And unfortunately, by the time of the Assembly election in 2016, no fewer than three opportunities to introduce the Irish Language Act were lost in those 10 years. The question came before the Assembly on three times, and it was out for public consultation. Um, the public consultation was held on the subject as well as on those three separate occasions. And on each occasion, 
there was support from a significant majority for Irish language rights. But progression, progression was hindered and blocked in the Assembly itself. And it is worth noting that the most recent consultation had 13,000 responses, with over 95% in favour of Irish language legislation. At this point, in, in late 2016, and Dram Jarrod campaign began, which reinforced the hashtag Act and Ace campaign that drove it to the very centre of political discourse in the North and put language rights at the top of the agenda of, talk, uh, agenda of talks in the negotiation process between 2017 and 2020. And in January 2020, a new commitment was achieved for Irish language legislation in the new decade new approach agreement. And through this legislation, the Office of the Language Commissioner Best Practice Language Standards would be established. It was promised that the language legislation would be enforced within 100 days of the agreement to be agreed, and this hasn't happened. A commitment was also made to the Irish language strategy, also part of the St Andrews Agreement in 2006, would be enforced within six months, and a timeline would be published within 100 days. That still hasn't happened. And you, you, you will be aware, members, Conor Nagel in recent weeks has instructed its solicitor to send a pre-action protocol letter to the Executive Office asking questions on why delay has taken place concerning the prog progression, the development of the strategy, and does it plan to bring it to the executive for agreement? As we understand, this has, this has not happened as recently as the last executive meeting, and efforts have, been put, uh, efforts have been made to put this on the executive agenda and have been in vain and goes as far back as November 2020. Now, often talked about before New Decade New New approach was the was, was the issue of sustainability. A touchstone issue for sustainability of the institutions has been the implementation of commitments and the framework and the peace agreements for the Irish language. Since 1988, it has been a rarity that commitments such as resolute action or policies as part of international treaties are implemented by regional and local governments. In fact, it has been the opposite. And since then, the Committee of Experts, COMAX, the Council of Europe Oversight Body that monitors the Member States' implementation of the European Charter has been consistent in its overwhelming criticism of the British government and in turn the devolved administration here regarding the full implementation of the Charter. COMAX assesses the implementation of around 35 different provisions for the, for the British government committing, committed to, to regarding the language, namely in education, public services, media, the judiciary, policy and legislation provision. And COMAX concludes with a, a series of extremely blunt recommendations for immediate action, including the adoption of a comprehensive law and a strategy on the promotion of Irish in the North, alongside 20 recommendations for the attention of the British government and the devolved administrations at Stormont. The vast majority of these re recommendations remain unfulfilled, and many are largely ignored in full. In March 2021, uh, the most recent COMAX report, COMAX responded to the UK government's report reiterating in full the need for full implementation of the Charter. Moreover, COMAX has concluded that the language legislation promised in a new decade new approach, while important, does not fulfil Irish Language Act, committed in two in St Andrews, and simply because it does not confer the same rights to Irish speakers here as Welsh language legislation does for Welsh speakers. And they concluded in this context that the Committee of Experts considers that even once measures contained in the January 2020 agreement are enacted, there remains a need for a comprehensive Irish Language Act. A Bill of Rights, as a bare minimum, should include a, full, a list of the full provisions of the European Charter as previously ratified by the British government in 2001. Secondly, the Bill of Rights should make provision in domestic law for protection and promotion of the language as laid out in the COMAX recommendations. This is a baseline for protections as laid down by leading international experts in this field. And the fact that the UK government has already signed up to this agreement should mean that it's straightforward addition. However, the lack of progress and implementation from the British government and the instalment highlights how rights can be abused, ignored, and Irish speakers excluded if those provisions are not enshrined in domestic or local legislation. And that's, I suppose, why it's important and probably most familiar with ourselves here today as it had had consequences for all in society, because the decision to cut the Modest Leafa Grant scheme is known for its direct role in the collapse of the devolved institutions in 2017. Minister Gibbon did not equality screen the decision and mysteriously found these funds for Leafa on the morning a protest was to take, take place outside his office despite defending 
the decision in the days before. There were, however, also other failures to comply with duties towards the Irish speaking community, and there are a range of examples of policy decisions that would have been untenable and challenge challengeable had a Bill of Rights been in place with protections for the Irish language. Government, government departments, including the Department of Education, that introduced English only policies. We have had MLAs, MPs, ministers, and various departments and roads intervene to ensure bilingual signage was hindered on tourism sites, on public service sites, and symbolic and petty decisions in the renaming of maintenance boats names from Irish to English. So the implementation of the European Charter and other international agreements and protocols are virtually absent in the North, and monolingual policies exist across many council areas. Many public authorities and councils are comfortable making regressive decisions and introducing policies undermined in the language because, because it's often enough decisions grounded in sectarianism are taking place at the heart of government. The above examples demonstrate the extent of which standards are not directly legally enforceable, and as they would be in a Bill of Rights, can risk being bypassed and ignored by government departments, local councils, and public bodies. New decade, new approach, a bill, new decade, new approach, a Bill of Rights, and a Bill of Rights should and could isolate the Irish language community from decisions rooted in sectarianism in the future and ensure the executive is implementing its legal duties to promote and encourage the Irish language. A Bill of Rights must include the recommendations above to ensure recognition and respect for speakers of Ireland's indigenous language and to ensure Irish speakers in 2021 feel that they can access services and provisions available to Irish, Welsh and Gaelic speakers across these islands. While significant for language, it is also about equal recognition for Irish cultural and national identity here in the North. And we have attached with our submission two significant recommendations. We recommend that the Bill of Rights includes under the European Charter for Regional Minority Languages and the Framework Convention for Protection of National Minorities are added into the Bill of Rights, therefore actionable in the domestic court to ensure Irish language community has access to the legal processes ensuring protection from those decisions we have experienced in the past. It should fully implement the most recent COMAC report regarding the implementation of the Charter. And we recommend the Bill of Rights to include a commitment on declaring a facial status for Irish, similar to what is applied to in Wales in the south of Ireland. In 2020, five parties signed up to the new decade new approach and promised a new year. We've seen in recent weeks how quickly parties can use Irish language to deny rights, deny speaker access to important services to facilitate citizens being able to live their lives through Irish. Together through a Bill of Rights, a language legislation committed to a new decade new approach, the full implementation of a comprehensive Irish language act as laid out in St Andrews, and through fully embracing the vision of resolute action for the language laid down in the Good Friday Agreement, Irish speakers should fully include it as equals here, with official status underpinned by effective legislation and effective rights, coupled with the political will to ensure all of our agreements and charters are implemented in full and as soon as possible. That's all from us in terms of our submission, um, but we're happy to move on to Q&A. Gora Mayagath Carher, thank you very much. Um, both that and your written presentation was was very helpful. Um, and I'll I'll throw in here. I've been asking a lot of the presenters that we've had over the course of the past year about a Bill of Rights function as an accountability mechanism. And I think you've probably highlighted there both in your oral submission and in the presentation that you, you sent us um, in advance of today's meeting in terms of the decisions that have been made for political reasons that would have been prevented with proper equality legislation or a Bill of Rights. So the things like you you referred to them there, the LIFA uh, scheme or grant decision, the dual language signage. We've seen umpteen decisions across across the North that have been, I suppose, based in anti-Irish sentiment or sectarian sentiment, to call it as, as, as you will. But how would a Bill of Rights act um, in Garden Against That? And in, I suppose meeting people where they are. So a Bill of Rights identifies that everyone is, is equal, but not everyone has equal requirements and that you have to acknowledge that different people have different characteristics and how does the law reflect that and work towards meaning that they have the same equality of opportunity regardless of their personal characteristics. And I wondered how, you, what, what, sort of, what sort of thing would you like to see out working from a Bill of Rights that would ensure that Irish language speakers and people that live their life through Irish have the exact same access to opportunities as anybody else. Yeah, no, no, no thank you, Emma, for, for your question. Certainly, 
many of the protections that are in place for the Irish language at the moment are international agreements, whether that's the Good Friday Agreement, whether it's the St Andrews Agreement, uh, or most recently the new, new decade, new approach, or the European Charter for Regional Minority Languages. While they are international agreements and being in breach of those, it would be in breach of international law, many government departments, public bodies, state agencies um, do not take those commitments very seriously at all because they're not actionable in a domestic court. So while we have been pushing for international best practice or standards in relation to how policies are in place, whether it be in local councils or um, the education authority or government departments, it is usually not taken at, at, at a level of seriousness, we, we, would, we would suggest, and often because it's not actionable in the court. In that sense, what we would envisage under, and we have mentioned a few things here, we've mentioned a new decade, new approach, we mentioned an, a comprehensive Irish language act in the European Charter, but a Bill of Rights rule would have a role in domesticating uh, and in placing some of those responsibilities that are in international agreements, like the European Charter for Regional Minority Lands, in a domestic legislation, which means if government departments or if a minister is in breach of its international obligations, that we can bring them to court. For example, the only way we have been able to bring the executive to court is through uh, Section 28D in relation to the strategy, um, which is which is part of uh, which was amended part of the Good Friday Agreement legislation in 1998 and amended it to Section 28D. Some of that will also happen under the new decade new approach. And there will be status given to the best practice standards and also to the commissioner. And if we aren't happy with certain parts of our complaints may be investigated, we will have the opportunity to, to go to court through that. But it's for, fairly minimal in terms of what how, how, how much we would actually be able to do. And that's why COMAX's most recent report suggests that while it is important and a historic and advancement, as we have said, and it's important that the legislation is brought forward in the new decade new approach, it is fairly minimal for what governments are expected to do in relation to the protection of minority languages. If I could just, um, if I could just um, compliment that in some way, suppose you know we have to look at language rights here very much as a minority rights issue. The European Charter is a minority rights framework in that international context. Um, the you know Irish language legislation uh, and Irish language legislation through a Bill of Rights, you know, in practice would give a clear and legal framework, enforceable in domestic law, uh, on what those rights actually look like. So while we see that opponents of the language all too quickly, you know, sort of test those relationships and block and frustrate progress on language issues time and time and time again, you know, our hand to combat that is very, very weak because political agreements are all well and good, but we see how political agreements can quickly fall apart and unravel. We can see that almost on a daily basis in the current climate that we're in. So our speakers, uh, and I think I can speak quite authoritatively on this, our faith in some political party to deliver on commitments isn't very high. There isn't a great currency within the community on placing trust in those parties to deliver on commitments that they've already made. So where political will and community trust is low, there has to be a clear and unambiguous legal framework on which communities can depend upon to access rights. And I don't think there's any clear way to say that. We would love to be in a position to say, we, we think New Decade, New Approach will deliver everything we want. But we're not there, and I think that's that's a that's a very reasonable analysis of where we're at. So, if if new decade, new approach in itself was enforceable in law, we'd be in the high court already. Um, so, we're, what we're left with is we're in a position where we have a very very strong international treaty through the European Charter. It's already ratified by the UK government in 2001 under Parts 2 and Parts 3 for Irish, a very strong international framework in terms of compliance for local government and asserting and providing a framework for rights and services for citizens here. But because that's not enforceable in domestic law, it's literally uh, cast aside. Um, and we have COMEX report after COMEX report that you know, damning reports that really, really condemn the UK government and in turn then the devolved administrations for that failure to implement what is there. Basically, all we're told is that, well, look, we don't have to do this. 
so we won't. So when, when our trust in the institute, when our trust and confidence in the ability to provide those 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 uh, safeguards and protections uh, fail, then we we have to go down the line of legislation. And what a legislation does, by very definition, is is it provides law that here's what you have to do by the law. Here's what you have to do in terms of providing rights. And if you don't do that, okay, we'll take we will take legal action. So very much a bill of rights for us will be providing legal insulation to our community that we are we have the confidence in our domestic structures to provide and facilitate the rights that we're entitled to uh, when you look at the language rights uh, provided across these islands to all of the other indigenous language speakers yeah, can, I, can i just add one thing emma i think like and it's not it's important that there is decisions being made that are rooted in sectarianism but there's also decisions being made with the fear of those who could cause hassle. And it's not that we often face opposition because people oppose the Irish language or dislike the Irish language. Sometimes they, if we get a draft policy through from a public body or a government department and we say, where's your branding or marketing? Where is your bilingual logo? Look, oh, listen, we have a certain member on our board who may kick up a stink or we, ha- we, we just don't want to rack the boat. So it's not necessarily overt, overtly opposition in terms of we hate the Irish language. It's also that fear of rocking the boat with people who would potentially be upset. Yeah, no, I'll take him. I, th- I suppose both of you are affirming um, what I was sort of indicating when I was asking the question and that this is basically just ensuring that if a person doesn't like a thing, that doesn't mean that they just get to ignore it. It's, in, it's enforcing it and it's making lawmakers act within the rights of, of everyone. I'm going to go to Paula and then I've got Carl and I don't have any other members indicating at the minute. So Paula, go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Patrick and um, Carl. Is that how I pronounce it? Apologies if I, if I pronounced it wrong there. Um, I don't really have a, a question as such. I have, I have to say, maybe I'm just tired, but I'm just exhausted for you as minority rights, um, or minority language right campaigner. I mean, we've been talking about this for years and I know people like Carl and others and Mark possibly have been campaigning and supporting you for probably decades now as, as, as public representatives. So I just to endorse what you've said there around, you know, these are international agreements, obligations, um, which they should be in domestic law so that they're enforceable. I think the, it is regrettable, I suppose, that um, COVID has delayed um, work on this um, at, within the department. I don't think it's through a lack of willingness of that particular minister. Um, but I, I just want to say yeah, my full support and that of my party, um, you know, minority languages for me is not just about learning the language, it's the culture around it, it's the educational benefits, it's the tourism culture, um, you know, the economy and stuff. So just to say you yeah, have my full support and, and well done for coming and, and appreciated your, your briefing today. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Paula. And just, you know, I think just to pick up on, on something you said, you know, we, I suppose as a community, we are exhausted. Um, because what you know, what we're being told quite publicly is, um, and in the last twenty four hours, is that we need to have a sense of realism. I think is the word that was used to describe. You know, we have to wait longer on agreements being fulfilled. Um, it's hugely frustrating to hear twenty three years after the Good Friday Agreement that come on now, lads, don't be don't be pushing this any quicker. That sixteen years after St Andrews or fifteen years after St Andrews, we're being told not quite yet. You know, 15 months after New Decade New Approach, you're being told, ah, well, maybe in the next mandate, or 250 years after the last penal law, ban an hour from courts, you're being told it's it's around the corner, maybe, maybe in the next few years. So, you know, when you put it in that context, um, generations of Irish speakers that have come before us um, have have walked this path, have met uh, political opposition. And I've said this quite recently in a number of committees, a lot of the heavy lifting has been done. A lot of the hard work for New Decade, New Approach has been done. It's not perfect. It doesn't confer all of the rights that, that we want. But we're very much in a place now where we need to get that legislation into practice, where we can test the legislation, where we can see how, how useful it is for people on the ground. We can see how a commissioner's role would inform that legislation, would shape the f- any future amendments to that legislation. And then we would also see gaps in provision as well, where, and we can come back to it. That's the reasonable and sensible approach to take. And we've signed up. You know, we're happy to go with that. That's, that's, how, that's how this is going to work. But it doesn't work if the political will isn't there. It doesn't work if the political ownership of that isn't there. And that has to go right across the executive. Everyone 
uh, lifted some of the heavy weight prior to January 2020, but that heavy lifting isn't finished yet. And to see the re regressive comments that we've seen recently does more harm than good, uh, I think. So I just want to I just want to top that up, Paula, with something that that the, the um the COMEX report gave us in in March just last week, two weeks ago, it was published. It was adopted on the twenty second of March. I'm just going to read it out here very quickly. I know we're pushed for time, but I think it's quite useful for this discussion. Um, under part twenty eight of their of their um uh document they wrote that the committee of experts maintains its position that an Irish language act and a strategy are integral to the protection and promotion of Irish. It cannot be re it cannot reiterate its previous recommendations to this effect. It welcomes that the proposed amendments to the Northern Ireland Act and a new decade new approach provide official recognition to Irish, but is concerned that these amendments have not been adopted and that their scope is also somewhat limited. It asks that further consideration be given in these amendments uh, to make express provision for specific language rights, such as in the fields of education, access to public services, public signage, and cultural activities. So what I think COMEX gives us there, folks, is a roadmap. It gives us uh, an indication of where we are going, where New Decade New Approach is very much a welcome first step. It shows that it doesn't confer the same rights to Irish speakers here as Welsh speakers are provided in Wales. And if the St Andrews Agreement is to be fully realised, then we have to look at the Welsh model as the benchmark of, of, of where we're going. It's going to take us time to get there. New Decade, New Approach gives us an opportunity to begin that journey. But if we don't start the journey, then we're never going to get there. So you, you can see how frustrated we are. A Bill of Rights is a mechanism to bring, bring us up to the international standard because New Decade, New Approach just, just won't get us quite there. Um, it won't give us the rights that we're entitled to, but the Bill of Rights is, is an avenue that could deliver you know, by its name, by its very virtue or raison d'etre, it could offer us the rights that we're entitled to across these islands. So thank yeah. you for your comments, Paula. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I suppose just to be absolutely clear, I appreciate it's not just yourselves and your board, it's the wider Irish um, speaking community who've been working for decades and as you say, generations now to push this forward. But I say you have my full support going forward. Can I can I just add something in, in relation to I listened to for the first minister Arling yesterday in relation to priorities of the executive and we're under no doubt and that naive to the pressures under the public health service and even civil service in, in relation to what has taken place for the past year in the pandemic um, and it was in our intent it, it, from what we have heard it has been the intention of the first minister to introduce new decade new approach um, legislation within this mandate but. It is our understanding and what we have seen, and we work with officials in the Department of Communities and the Executive Office, and we've been working with them closely and the Department of Finance in recent, in, in, over the past 15 months to ensure across many of the departments that commitments are made and introduced and implemented as soon as possible. But there is no excuse anymore because the legislation was pre-prepared and it is there sitting and the preparatory work has been done. And we know, and we, 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 we've we met with, with Sinn Féin and, and those who are working in the executive office in Dakin Kearney, and they also share that of the, of the same view. But most importantly, there was a suite of social strategies agreed by the exact, by Department of Communities Minister Carl, who is here, in September 2020, to also agree the timeline and the expert panel in November 2020 that had to go to the executive for a formality of agreement in this early December. It is our understanding that it has been brought to the executive, the executive office to be put on the agenda every week up until the, the most recent meeting and hasn't been put on the, the executive agenda. So that, as much as uh, as the pandemic is here, but I think, as I said before, we can walk into the room. I think that the government has learned that we can deal with the pandemic, but also work with, with ensure the commitments made in, that a huge cornerstone of the new decade new approach can also be committed to uh, in this mandate. Thank you. Thanks, pa Paula. Carol, go ahead, and then I've got Mark and the kitten and Shin. So, Josh says, "Guy, look, it's false or good yet for Kesha." Um, August Indian live go home now. Um, Indian live got fuckle. Um, so just welcome the three lads to the the committee, and I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, new decade, new approach for me is the floor rather than the ceiling. And as a parent, a grandparent, um, and a, an activist, um, I'm, you know, sure what Paula has said to you is, you know, tired of listening to every excuse on the sun. 
botnia with stantical foil, we're not going anywhere. Um, I think that denial of rights for Irish language speakers is debatable, quite frankly. I think it's racist. I think it's sectarian and it's anti-rights. And if you can't actually see in the context of a new decade, new approach, the continuation of a hold up, then I, I really don't know what is. So I'm glad to disagree and I'm not surprised, but I am glad that you agree that this needs, the language rights need to be protected within a new Bill of Rights, because you're 100% right. Comax said that new decade, new approach will not achieve full rights for language speakers, but we need to start somewhere. Um, I mean, preferably uh, the bill that I brought forward would have even been a start, even changes for that. And that, I mean, that's already outdated. But given the fact these, that you have said that this has been prevented by, I'm assuming, by the DUP, but I don't know, um, prevented from going on the executive for discussion, um, what, what other options do you have? I mean, I appreciate you, you and others had to go to court for a, an anti-poverty strategy, which was denied, as well as an Irish language strategy, which was denied. So um, are you... I'm hoping that you'll get full agreement for inclusivity of um, language rights in the Bill of Rights, um, because that, in my estimation, would certainly be more encompassing um, and would certainly be judged by international standards. Um, so, and given the fact that as co-guarantors of Good Friday Agreement, St Andrews, the NDNA, um, that both British and Irish governments have responsibility to ensure this is achieved. So, Gormir, I'll go for Ashton. Kinsha, Kinsha, Carol, um, I think what, you know our first our first port of call, um, as as you'll be aware, um, obviously I agree with with everything you've said. There is is the fact that we need to get and continue to lobby to get new decade, new approach through. We need to do that with everyone around the executive table, but we also need to do that with our other stakeholders, the British and Irish governments. Not only are the co guarantors. But the British and Irish governments are co-authors of New Decade and Your Approach. They, they read it. They uh, they delivered the legislation that was published for the parties to agree to. So, so they wrote the agreement. They co-guaranteed the agreement. They're not neutral bystanders here by any means. They're very active players with very real responsibilities. And we have to make sure that they live by those responsibilities and set a good example for others to do the same. Um, but where, where New Decade New Approach has found one thing, we believe the Bill of Rights is, is the perfect mechanism to deliver language rights. Um, and it should do that by the two recommendations we're making here, i.e. To, to domesticate into our own laws here the, the provisions within the European Charter under Parts 2 and Parts 3. And this, let's, let's not forget, this is an international charter that's already been ratified by the UK government in 2001. So by principle, you would imagine... UK government already support all of those provisions and by extension, they would support those provis provisions being implemented into domestic law. So, uh, you know, f forgive me if I'm being a wee bit uh, naive here, but I would believe that that's a tick in the box. That's easily achieved. Um, and we maybe test the British government to see where they stand on that in the very near future. Um, secondly, then we're, we're asking for um, the, the Irish to be granted co-official status uh, here in the North. Uh, and we believe that that's an extension or a realised factor of the St Andrews Agreement. The St Andrews Agreement makes provision for an Irish Language Act based on the models in Ireland and in Wales. Though both of those jurisdictions provide Welsh and Irish in turn as official languages. And we know that when the, when, uh, the Indigenous language is made in law as an official language, that that fundamental right then flows from that single line provision. So domesticating the European Charter through a Bill of Rights and identifying legally the Irish language as an official language, as is as per the wording in, in the Welsh legislation, are the two cornerstone provisions through which a Bill of Rights can bridge the gap between international standards of where we need to be and what's promised the new decade, new approach. I agree, Carol, the new decade, new approach is a floor. Um, and we're reaching for the ceiling and we're continuously going to be doing that. But why not? We can also uh, um, fast track a lot of this work as well. And a, and a Bill of Rights should provide language rights. It's, it's re relatively simple, simple when you take a step back. We have the right to use the language, the right to see the language. 
uh, the right for education through the language and all of the other provisions under part two and part three of the European Charter. The work's done, the framework's there. We just need to get it into domestic law. Thank you, Carl. Carl like it. No, and just yeah, there, Carl, like, the obvious thing was, and I said this before, was that the idea that was the, what was the topical at the time was the sustainability of the institutions for those who are interested in it. And that if those protections were in place under a Bill of Rights in 2016 and 2017 and prior, just after the, the Assembly election, you mightn't have found yourself in some of the situations that we were in in, in January 2017 when, they, when the institutions fell. So it's vitally important moving forward for anyone that's interested in, in the stability of the institutions that the language protections are there, particularly in the Bill of Rights. Thank you. Shantasa Carl, yeah? Okay, I'm going to go to Mark now. Your man, I'll go to Kaherdiak, I'll go to Falcherov, Tamira, Gir Mohodskil, Jalim, and we held a couple of Fokal, Ara, Erdus, Antim, Yav, Gir Raki, Octi, Orin Ganwell. I'd start just by welcoming you and, and saying that I'd agree with you entirely that uh, we do need comprehensive. Uh, legislation as, as soon as possible. I think it's probably the understatement of, of the century to say that the Irish language has become something of a political uh, hot, hot potato. And I'd commend you guys and the organisation's commitment uh, to pursuing this. But you can hear there you've almost moved beyond frustration, which is perfectly understandable. Into the of fatigue. Spoken of the failure to get legislation through, the failure to get potential legislation even debated in the floor of the Assembly or even onto the a a executive agenda, the failure thus far to deliver the commitment of MDNA, while you know, COVID can be used as, as, as maybe an excuse for some of this not happening as quickly as we would like to. Commitments in MDNA, and there's a, a whole suite of them, and do a kind of cost analysis or breakdown, uh, obviously there's going to be c competing demands and, and one of those demands is going to be a, fi a financial one. But uh, if you look at the commitments in terms of, of language uh, legislation, that would cost a lot less than, than a lot of the other stuff in there. And, and, and to me, there, there's no reason what, why, why we couldn't or shouldn't be progressing that, uh, on that. And Crawford kind of beat me to the punch there, but what I had been going to ask is that had we had a Bill of Rights, would we, is it safe to say, we, we would have had a, an Irish language strategy by now, we would have had an Irish language act by now, and it, it could even almost have been taken out or away from the heat of the political bat battleground. Uh, nobody, I think we've seen this in, in relation to many presentations or, or evidence sessions, uh, throughout the, the lifetime of this committee, but nobody should be threatened by rights or, or feel threatened by rights, and that everyone suffers uh, from the failure to implement and recognise the rights of one section of the community. And the consequence, in, in my view, of ignoring, and not just ignoring, but actually riding roughshod over the rights of Irish language speakers played a, 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 a part, not just in the collapse of the Assembly, but a, a major part in the failure or, or, or the length of time it took to put Humpty back together again. But uh, would you agree that, the, I suppose, in the impact on the rights of many as a consequence of that, of, of us not having a government for three years, that impacted on the rights of, of, of so many people across so many spheres in society, but did that underlines the need for a Bill of Rights containing language rights? Gurmoy uh, Mark, thanks very much for those comments. I think you put your finger on it when you said, you know, rights are to be enjoyed by all and to be denied by none. We're very clear that the Irish language belongs to everyone um, and everyone has the right to access and use and learn and come on this journey to, to sort of learn about our people and our place and, and the language that links us all together. But let's be very clear, language rights and the issue of, of regional indigenous minority rights isn't unique just to here and it isn't a contested subject or it's a contested subject in other places like it is here as well um but i think you know the welsh uh, the welsh have really laid 
the charge on this in terms of how they've legislated for the language time and time again, how they've strengthened their legislation. And like you say, how the legislation has removed the language from the party political environment or, or, and from when I say that I mean from that sort of vexed confrontational atmosphere and how it does that is by setting down a clear legal unambiguous legal framework um, by which everyone has to um, comply um, so legislation is the way to deal with that comment almost around of politicization of the language to take it out of that political uh, pitch um, and to place it in a very legal uh, setting so that everyone's aware of how the language has to be dealt with, how the language has to be promoted, uh, and it's not up for individual interpretation uh, as as it almost is currently. Um, so we need to we need to get that on the, we need to get the new decade new approach commitments in the statute books, and then we also need to strengthen those commitments. And I, and I believe we believe that the Bill of Rights is the correct mechanism through which we should deliver those rights, um, and it should be done. Uh, and you know, in tandem with the Welsh model, it should be done alongside those linguistic experts. Because, like I said, language rights isn't unique to here. These conversations are happening right across Europe, right across the world, where bilingual and trilingual uh, citizens are sort of are, are are campaigning and lobbying for uh, for equality. Um, and we're, we we always try to be very clear. Yes, this is a question of party of esteem. Yes, it's a question of equality for our speakers here who have been marginalised and excluded for decades and longer. But this is a question of equity you know when when you haven't been afforded rights for so long just providing those rights almost isn't even enough there, that needs to be done in tandem with a process that that brings communities along and brings them up to speed on why those rights are necessary and and fills the void in terms of context of why those rights are necessary so we need to we need to do both of those things in tandem um, and we believe that the Irish language has an awful lot to offer us here as a people, as a place, and as a community, as a broad community that's 23 years on from our main peace accord, that the Irish language has a huge role to play in terms of reconciliation and bringing people together and should be able to do so, rather than being something that divides us, um, removing Irish from that sort of political environment and placing it in an illegal footing through a Bill of Rights should be a mechanism through which we can come together and enjoy the language in that shared future we all talk about. Can doubt, and would you be of the view that was it put in that framework work that might in a way get off the hook those who are politically opposed to the Irish language and the extension of, of, of rights to the Irish language community? One hundred percent. Well, listen, when 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 something's in law, it works one or two ways. You play with you can play with the law or you don't, and if you don't, then you know it's challenged and it's usually in, the, the laws enforced appropriately. So what it does, it it, it removes that it move, removes that language from that party political decision making process, and almost from that, um, you know, we we see the language being used um, at times of increased tension as something to cause hurt or to cause uh, insult or to cause frustration to other parts of different communities. So what we clearly want to do is to remove the language in that, in that way so that it can become a tool for minority language um, revival. It can become a tool for community um, development. It can become a tool for youth work. It can become a tool for sport and education um, because it has so much potential in all of those fields. Um, rather than being misused as times as we've seen in the past. So but the, the mechanism through which to do that, Mark, is by giving it a very clear and clear legal definition. Um, and the Bill of Rights, like I say, it's Rosan Daudra should be to facilitate rights and language rights should be right at the top of that agenda. Thank you, Mark. Okay, I don't have any other members indicating. I can see Michelle is in the, the spotlight as well, but unless you want to ask any questions, Michelle, jump in if you do. Okay, um, so look, Kraher August Podrick, thank you very much for being so accommodating this afternoon. You'll notice that we've actually went past our original um, state of time because there's been some changes to the timing of the ad hoc committee on the, the COVID response, and that's been extended now. So we actually weren't as pushed for time 
in reality as we thought we were going to be. So apologies for, for rushing you the way we did at the very outset. And I just want to thank you again for your presentation and for taking the time to go through all the questions and answers. And this has been helpful, I think, and, you know, putting language rights as basically expression of identity and people being allowed to express themselves as they wish, which is a fairly basic and integral part of all our lives and, and something that be that should be recognized as such, I think. So um, I just appreciate your time this afternoon and for your contribution and we'll let you take your ease and enjoy the rest of your day. Gormagov. Gormagov, Gormagov, for fat. Thanks for having us, folks. Slan live. Slan. Okay, members. Podrick and Krahar have left the meeting now, so we're going to go back to front um, and we were going to deal with some of the, the committee business at the, at the start of the meeting and then because we didn't have quorum, we weren't able to. So um, we haven't had Mike join us yet or um, Christopher. So we've, we've got five members and we're still all right. So um, I'm going to go through here. Chairperson's business. We don't have any chair's business um, this afternoon, so we can move on to our agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. And you'll find the draft minutes for our last meeting, which was held on the 25th of March at page 27 of your packs. If members are content with those minutes, yeah, I can see a nodding head. Um, matters arising. Number four, we don't have any matters arising this afternoon. Go ahead to correspondence. Um, members, you'll find the correspondence memo um, in your table papers pack. I think it was the second table papers pack that we had, um, page 122 of that. And we have correspondence from Dame Vera Baird, who had, as I explained at the outset, uh, uh, sent her apologies for being able to uh, be unable to attend today's meeting. And then we had correspondence from the Presbyterian Church in Ireland in relation relation to the briefing that had been scheduled then for this afternoon and then had to be postponed again and correspondence from the Executive Office RE the update on the panel of experts so if members are content to note this correspondence again nodding heads thank you very much then with the forward work program members that's uh, agenda item nine and you'll remember that the last meeting, we agreed to rescind the earlier decision to report to the Assembly by the summer recess. Um, so the forward work programme has been amended to reflect that change. We'll also know that at the strategy meeting on the 4th of February, we agreed that the committee staff should try to arrange meetings with the Supreme Courts in Dublin and London. These are both on an informal basis and they have now been arranged as well as a meeting with the Arachthus Committee and the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. So we've got the Arachthus Committee and the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement on Friday the 30th of April at 11am, if members can put that in their diary. And then we've got the Justice of the Supreme Court of Ireland on Thursday the 6th of May at 415 So are members content to schedule those meetings? Yeah, and we've got the meeting with the British Supreme Courts, I think, next week or the week after. So we'll see them then. Um, any other business that members want to raise? No. That has been very short and sharp. So the date, time and place of the next meeting is next Thursday, the 22nd, same time, same place. And that's when we're going to have the UK Supreme Court. So thank you. Slan live. Thank you.